Well, good afternoon, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, I want to, first of all, acknowledge the funeral of George Floyd, which is happening right now as we speak. Uh, and I ask all of you to join me in a brief moment of silence to honor him. Thank you. I hope that all of you are staying healthy and safe. I'll speak to our COVID numbers uh, in a few minutes, uh, but overall, they are looking good. And I wanted to take this opportunity as we talk about the phases and as we talk about uh, our excitement of uh, getting our kids back into the classroom, uh, getting our scholars back onto the college uh, and university campuses, that we're able to do what we're doing because of you as Virginians uh, that have listened to our guidelines, that have cooperated, and while I know many of us have made sacrifices uh, together, uh, all of you have been part of the solution. So on behalf of uh, Virginia, I, I say thank you. Uh, and I also emphasize that uh, we're working toward the new normal. We need to continue uh, with the wearing of our facial protection, our, our social distancing, and our, our uh, guidance with hygiene. So I, I thank all of you for that as we move forward. Today I'd like to talk to you about our guidance for schools in phase two and beyond. Uh, as well as announce some exciting appointments. But I'd like to begin with a meeting I had earlier today with leaders of our Police Chiefs Association. We had a very frank discussion about the pain that so many Americans are feeling right now and the protest over policing in communities of color. We also talked about what steps need to be taken to ensure that we can move forward on policies that protect our communities and improving the way we handle other social issues such as response to people in mental health crises. We had a very good conversation. I told them I know how hard everyone is working right now and that we all share the goal of rebuilding trust within our communities. We'll need everyone at the table for that. So while I spoke today with police chiefs, I intend to meet with other stakeholders, activists, and many others. This is an opportunity for serious reform, and we have to be serious about how we do it. This includes listening and learning from wise and thoughtful people. I also had a call this morning with Chief D Justice, D excuse me, Donald Lemons of our Virginia Supreme Court to thank him for putting a 21-day moratorium on evictions while we work to finalize our rent relief plan using federal funding. So thank you, Chief Justice Lemons, for your leadership. Now I'd like to turn to some personnel appointments starting with two gentlemen, uh, one of whom could not be with us, uh, but they are, uh, he's uh, very excited about his new position, uh, and uh, future Judge Jamal Hudson uh, is with us today. Uh, so today I am announcing that I'm appointing Curtis Brown to the role of state coordinator for the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Curtis has served as chief deputy coordinator of VDEM and has extensive experience in emergency management. He is also an important part of our health equity work group and is co-founder of the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management. I am confident that he is the right person to lead that agency as we continue to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, this year's hurricane season, which hopefully will be quiet, um, and any other emergency that comes our way. I'm also appointing Jamal Hudson to fill a judicial vacancy at the State Corporation Commission. Mr. Hudson has served as Director of Government Affairs for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and has extensive experience working on the regulatory issues that frequently come before the SCC. His appointment was unanimously supported during session by Democrats and House Republicans, I am confident Mr. Hudson is well suited to fulfill his duties at the SCC. So 
uh, Jamal, just congratulations and we welcome you. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. In addition today, I'm making three new appointments to the Virginia Crime Commission. The panel studies public safety issues from policing to parole and its work shapes justice policy in our Commonwealth. I'm appointing the following members. Chief Larry Boone, who is chief of the Norfolk Police Department. Chief Boone has worked throughout his career to forge relationships and build trust between citizens and law enforcement. He's a reformer. We saw that as he marched with demonstrators and carried a Black Lives Matter sign. Chief Boone created the Office of Community Relations, successfully launching over 20 programs. He's also a member of the Virginia African American Advisory Board as a black police chief serving a city with a 43% black population, he will bring personal and professional experience that will provide an important perspective to the Crime Commission's work. I'm also appointing Larry Terry, the director of the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service at the University of Virginia. Dr. Terry has a long history of supporting returning citizens as they transition from correctional facilities back into the community through counseling, education planning, and resource identification. He has experience working for organizations dedicated to restorative justice and second chances. Dr. Terry recently participated in a paroling project with our office and the National Governors Association, as well as serving on a working dialogue with the Department of Corrections and Parole Board to identify housing opportunities for returning citizens. Dr. Terry is well equipped to serve the Commonwealth in this capacity. And third, I'm appointing Laurie Haas of the Coalition, Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. After Laurie's daughter was injured in the Virginia Tech shooting, Laurie became very active in gun violence pre pre prevention work and has been an instrumental leader in Virginia and at the federal level, successfully helping to pass critical gun violence prevention laws. She is well known for her tremendous knowledge, passion, and advocacy. These are thoughtful people who Virginians can trust. I believe all three of them will provide important voices and expertise to the Crime Commission, and I thank them for their willingness to serve. Now I'd like to move to the coronavirus update. I know that recent events have overshadowed the pandemic, but it is still very much with us. That said, our health metrics are looking positive. The percent of positive tests over the past 14 days is trending downward, and statewide it's about 10% right now. Our hospitalizations for COVID are trending downward, particularly in the last week. Our general hospital bed capacity is sufficient. Our hospitals also report enough PPE, and we continue to work with other health settings to ensure that they have the PPE that they need. We continue to increase our testing capacity, and we are moving toward our goal of hiring contact tracers. For July, we're aiming for 15 contact tracers for every 100,000 people, 1,200. Right now, we have a total of 872 people statewide on our contact tracing team. That's a combination of new hires and existing VDH staff and volunteers. So overall, our numbers look good. Most of Virginia just entered phase two on Friday. Northern Virginia and the city of Richmond remained in phase one. But the metrics from those areas also look positive and they can move into phase two as of this Friday, the 12th of June. Now I'd like to talk about our public schools, K through 12. I know that parents are very interested in our plans for how to safely return children to our classrooms. As you recall, on March the 23rd, I closed all Virginia schools for the remainder of the academic year. Virginia was one of the first states to take this step. I believe that these closures have helped mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in our communities over the last few months. 
Since that time, our schools have risen to the occasion and found ways to continue providing instruction, keep students engaged in learning from afar, continue serving meals for children who otherwise would have gone hungry, and support students and families through an immensely challenging time. When we moved all of our schools to remote learning, we were clear that that shutdown would extend for the remainder of the school year. This school year is over. Seniors have graduated, even though it has not been the celebration that our students and families would have wanted. But we know parents want to know what to expect this summer and in the fall. To be clear, all Virginia schools will open for students next year, but the school experience will look very different. These phases will allow in-person instruction, but slowly. We'll start with small groups and we'll allow each school division the flexibility that it needs to respond to the needs of its own locality. I want to be clear that these phases provide our schools with options for consideration, not mandates to open their buildings for summer school. Rather, this phased approach provides some in-person instructional opportunities for divisions to consider throughout the summer and will help divisions begin planning for the 2021 school year. What this looks like on the ground is that to start with, most instruction is still virtual. In phase two, which most schools can enter right now, schools may offer in-person instruction for preschool through third graders and English language learners. They can also provide in-person instruction for students with disabilities. It also means school-based summer camps may operate with some restrictions. For the future, phase three will allow schools to shift to in-person instruction for all students. But they will need to put physical distancing measures in place. For example, schools may have to stagger schedules or adopt class schedules that blend in-person and remote learning. We'll expect schools to have six feet between desk and workstations. There will be restrictions on mixing groups of students. Schools will have to stagger the use of communal spaces, such as cafeterias, or close them. There should be remote learning and telework options for high-risk students and staff. There will be daily health screenings and wearing of face coverings by staff where physical distancing cannot be maintained. While our Executive Order 63 includes exceptions for face coverings in school settings, we will encourage students to wear face coverings as well, especially our older students. Schools must submit plans to the Virginia Department of Education outlining how they'll comply with these guidelines before entering phase two or phase three. School divisions also have flexibility to limit in-person instruction if needed. This approach to reopening our schools protects and prioritizes the health and social, emotional, and physical well-being of students and staff as public health conditions evolve. Now I'll ask our superintendent of schools, Dr. James Lane, to speak about this guidance for our schools. And I would uh, just want to remind all of you a significant amount of work, a significant amount of discussion uh, with input from a, a lot of folks uh, around the communities in Virginia has taken place, a lot of meetings. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Lane, I just wanted to take the opportunity again on the behalf of Virginia to, to thank you for, for all of your great work. And uh, I know that uh, parents and students and faculty educators are all very excited to, to move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. While we are here to announce Virginia's return to school plan, I want to pause and recognize the broader situation we find ourselves in as a city, a commonwealth, and, in a, and as a nation in this moment. We are having overdue and necessary but difficult conversations about systemic and historic racism and its continuing presence in American 2020. Education is a system with its own racist history and present day challenges. And as the agency responsible for schools, 
We remain committed to tackling these conversations and necessary policy changes to ensure that the color of a student's skin doesn't dictate the education opportunity that they have access to. We must eliminate achievement and opportunity gaps. We must have culturally relevant standards and practices. And I am committed to eradicating racism from our schools and communities. I'd like to now walk through the particulars of the phased reopening plan for all of Virginia's K-12 public and private schools. This plan gradually phases in opportunities for in-person instruction while prioritizing the health and safety of students and staff. Schools will open for all students next year, but as the governor said, instruction will look different. Virginia schools are required to deliver new instruction to students for the 2020-2021 academic year. And some of that will happen in person, and some of that will happen via remote learning. Virginia's return to school plan aligns to the governor's reopening phases within the Forward Virginia blueprint. It scales up opportunities for in-person instruction beginning immediately. It focuses on the health, social, emotional, and physical well-being of our students and staff. And it prioritizes the needs of our most vulnerable learners for whom in-person instruction is most essential and remote learning was the most difficult. This approach is equity focused, but moves us to the end goal of safe in-person instruction for all students. So to reiterate some of what the governor already shared, in phase one, which begins immediately for everyone, but obviously many of our communities have moved on to phase two, special education and childcare for working families can be done in person. We've heard from our community significant concerns about the needs of our students with disabilities and the need to get those students back into their services and programs immediately. And so that's allowed in all schools. We move to phase two, where the programs for students with disabilities and childcare for working families is expanded upon with options for preschool through third grade students, English learners, and summer camps in school buildings. And again, we wanted to focus on getting education to our earliest learners because of the challenges that they were facing in the remote learning environment while also making sure that we could keep them safe. In phase three, all students may begin to receive in-person instruction, but it must be accommodated within strict social distancing measures. So this will likely require staggered schedules and innovative approaches to the way that students come to our buildings. And we are all looking forward to the day that we're on beyond phase three, resume, resuming to a new normal and, and having all of our students in buildings every day. The phases provide maximum flexibility at any given time and apply to both public and private schools. It's important to note that schools may be more limited in their in-person instructional offerings than the phase allows. So it allows flexibility for school divisions to put in more stringent measures as they need based on the conditions in their community. Before entering phase two and three, every school in Virginia must submit plans to the Department of Education outlining their compliance with the VDH and CDC mitigation strategies. Uh, the Virginia Council for Private Education, who's here with us, will receive plans submitted by private schools accredited through the VCPE approved state recognized accrediting associations. But all of those health related plans will come to the DOE and we'll work closely with VCPE on those for private schools. Our public schools will also be required to submit a plan for providing new instruction for all students in the 2020-2021 academic year, regardless of phase or their operational status of the school at the time. Most of the state has entered phase two Richmond and Nova and others are still exceptions, but phase one is relevant for a few jurisdictions now and would be relevant if we move back to a more restrictive environment due to public health conditions. So we wanted to make sure you knew about phase one as well. But that means that most school divisions will move to, move to phase two. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth on each phase and then uh, wrap up uh, and turn it back to the governor. In phase one, again, instruction is predominantly remote, however, exceptions will be made for schools to offer in-person instruction for students with disabilities. Schools may uh, elect to provide extended school year services and school year special education services, including private placements with strict social distancing. Students will only attend such programs if the independent individualized education program team agrees it is appropriate and the parent consents. Then we move into phase two, which where we still have predominantly remote instruction, but in addition to the phase one exception, schools may offer 
those uh, in-person instruction for pre-K through third grade students, English learners, and permit summer, ca summer camps to operate in school settings. It's important to note that in phase two, large group gatherings are limited to 50 people based on the governor's still uh, existing executive order. In phase three, schools may shift to in-person instruction for all students, but with those physical distancing measures in place, staggered schedules and alternative blended options for remote learning will be important for students. In all phases, schools are expected to follow the CDC school guidance strategies for protecting the health of staff and students, cleaning and disinfecting, ensuring physical distancing, limiting the mixing of groups and students, and implementing mitigation strategies. But this also means that remote options must be made available for students and staff who have complicating health factors and who are safer at home. So all schools must have a plan for those students and staff as well. The physical distancing strategies include, but are not limited to, six-foot physical distancing between desks, workstations, teachers and students, and students and other students to the greatest extent possible. Restrictions on mixing groups of students or classes of students, the combination of those measures will likely necess necessitate staggered or unique schedules. Closing or staggering the use of communal spaces, including cafeterias, so students may have to be served in their classroom. As the governor mentioned, daily health screenings of students and staff, the department will be providing guidance on those. Uh, all schools must provide those remote learning exceptions and teleworking for students and staff who are at higher risk of severe, severe illness. The use of cloth face coverings by staff is required when six foot social distancing cannot be maintained. For students, face coverings are encouraged but not required as developmentally appropriate and especially in older students and in settings where students cannot maintain physical distancing. Again, this guidance applies to all of Virginia's public and private schools. More detail will be available in the coming days. I will share the Department of Education has produced Recover, Redesign, and Restart. This is nearly a 126-page guide that will go to our school divisions today and be posted online that schools can use to assist in their planning for opening schools under these phases. Um, we find that this document we believe that this document is comprehensive. It's been informed by a diverse set of education stakeholders, and schools should use it in their planning. Uh, it was created with the guidance of numerous task forces, dozens of teachers, principals, parents, uh, educator, education leaders, superintendents that came together to make this possible from every corner of the Commonwealth. We are confident that this additional guidance will, will help schools as they develop plans. We know there will be lots and lots of questions on the school opening plans, and so with that, I'll turn it back to the governor. Um, also posted today from the governor will be the phased guidance for Virginia schools that sh shares everything that I've shared today in writing along with a PowerPoint that can easily be accessed to provide that information. Thank you, Governor, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Well, thank you again for, for all of that work, and I know uh, uh, all of our, our families and students and faculty are are anxious to get back into our schools, and I, I think the main message out of this is that uh, they'll be back in school this fall. So that's that's really uh, exciting news for I think for for all Virginians. Uh, we've also had a number of folks ask about our guidance around youth sports in phase two, um, and uh, just uh, I, growing up uh, where I did, uh, just always enjoyed sports. I, I know that. Uh, we, we encourage, uh, especially as a physician, uh, our students and, and children to be out uh, active and, and, and playing and, and getting good exercise. So, uh, so this is also exciting. And, and um, I was going to uh, go through this with you, but uh, uh, our chief of staff is also a, a former athlete uh, and also has two young children who love being outside and, and playing sports. So uh, I'm going to yield to our chief of staff, Clark Mercer. Clark. Well, thank you, Governor. And again, Clark Mercer, the Governor's Chief of Staff. And I want to thank um, the folks from all across the Commonwealth for calling and, and putting the recommendations. And uh, this is a, uh, there's a lot of sports out there. And every day when you think you kind of have everything figured out, someone calls with a new situation you haven't thought of. So I wanted to go through our overarching guidelines for youth sports in, in phase two. And um, I, I will start by saying it's applying common sense incidental versus accidental contact and shared equipment. That's really what we need to be thinking about when our kids are back out 
uh, play in sports. Uh, incidental contact is obviously accidental contact, temporary contact that you don't plan on in a sport. And we understand you can't play sports, a lot of them, without having incidental contact. Intentional contact, there's some sports you just can't play without intentionally uh, coming across someone else and having sustained contact. So that's kind of a guiding post for what we're going to talk about. Also, shared equipment. Uh, we need to minimize and, 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 and prohibit the use of shared equipment in phase two. Um, but we will have our kids out playing sports. And I'll give a couple examples of incidental contact versus intentional. Uh, karate classes. Can my, my child go back to having indoor karate classes? Yes. Can your child spar with another child and have intentional contact in those classes? No. We've had folks that run ice skating arenas. Can ice skating uh, start again? Yes. Can we have ice dancing in the ice skating arenas? Uh, no. Uh, baseball. Uh, when I was growing up, we all shared a helmet. And we all shared, shared baseball bats. That's not a common protocol now. You have your own bat. You have your own helmet. There's not shared equipment in baseball. Certainly, there is some incidental contact that we recognize. Uh, football. High school football. Folks should be training right now, getting ready. I don't know what will happen with the high school season down the road. But certainly, quarterbacks can be thrown to receivers. Receivers are wearing gloves. That's kind of common sense. We're not doing tackle football in the middle of the summer uh, anyway. There's certainly some weight training, not using shared equipment, some drills that linemen can do that will accommodate the phase two uh, guidelines. Uh, soccer, I coached high school soccer for six years. Uh, there's ways to train uh, and structure your practices without having intentional contact. With shared equipment with soccer, it's a very easy to structure a practice to avoid, for example, having throw-ins, right? You can restart from the ground. Uh, obviously, in competitive soccer, once we get going with that, uh, you can't do that. But certainly, for most of the training that we do across the Commonwealth, you don't have to, to have everyone uh, picking up the ball and throwing it, throwing it in. So that's kind of applying some of the, the common sense uh, guidelines. In terms of capacity on our, our fields, indoor and outdoor, indoor is going to be less capacity. It's 30 percent for an indoor field or 50 people, whichever is the lesser amount. And that's per field. So some of our sports complexes that are large and have a baseball diamond, a volleyball uh, court, and a soccer field, it's, it's per each, each room should have its own capacity limit, and you'll know how to, to structure that. Outdoors, it's 50% uh, capacity or 50 people, whichever is less for youth sports. And this is, I think, I was on the phone a couple days ago with a group of folks that coach baseball around the Commonwealth. For youth sports, we need our parents to be able to come, drop our kids off, and watch, and for the children that they're overseeing. So it's, uh, there's no limit or capacity for the youth sports for spectators, given that their parents are guardians either watching their children or taking care of their children uh, at the game. And kind of common sense again, baseball, we've got the diamond, two dugouts, teams separated and fans on either side down the first and third baseline, watching from the outfield, social distancing, soccer, lacrosse, those sorts of things. You have fans, typically two teams on either sideline, again, uh, social distancing, leaving some space in between spectators with a high likelihood, at least in my household, that my son or daughter comes running over for more orange slices or to take a timeout in the middle of the game and is hot and sweaty and perspiring. And obviously, the 10 feet of distance that we're trying to maintain in fitness classes, our gyms, athletics, recognizes that when you are exercising, those air particles um, move a little bit quicker and there's more likelihood of spread. So that's the, the reason for 10 feet. But phase two, these are phases. They're not permanent. We will have a phase three in Virginia that the governor will articulate the guidelines for, but you will be able to get your sons and daughters out practicing and playing uh, this Friday. Let's just do it in a uh, smart way. Thank you. In closing, I uh, want to remind Virginians that today uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, is the last day to request an absentee ballot to vote in the June 23rd congressional primaries. Elections matter, uh, and I'd encourage voters to vote absentee by mail to the extent possible. Now we'll hear a health update from Dr. Norm Oliver, and then I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. So just quickly on the uh, numbers for COVID-19 today, um, we currently, um, in the last reporting period, have recorded 487 new uh, cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number of cases in the Commonwealth to 51,738. We also recorded 19 new deaths, 
bringing the total deaths to 1,496. We posted uh, over that last uh, reporting period 7,260 uh, new PCR uh, tests. Um, I need to uh, uh, notify you all that we have a large lab in central Virginia that has not been on electronic lab reporting with us. Uh, and there's been a large backlog of uh, manual uh, lab reports from that lab. Um, we have, uh, over the last couple of weeks, arranged for them to uh, now report uh, electronically. So over the next uh, couple of days, you will see a big jump in the number of tests that will be the result of these thousands of labs being uh, put into our data uh, uh, base. Um, on the demographic breakdown um, of the number of cases for which we have uh, race and ethnicity data uh, available, we have 7,154 cases in, among African Americans, or about 20% of those cases. Uh, we have uh, 311 deaths among African Americans, or about 23%. Among Latinx um, population, um, Number of cases is 17,269, and that's about 50% of the cases that for which we have uh, race and ethnicity uh, data. And the deaths in that community, 145, uh, which is about 11% uh, of those um, that we have that information on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Governor. Governor. Thank you. Be glad to take questions. On the least statute litigation, and also can you talk about maybe not being able to be at that uh, injunction hearing yesterday and kind of your, your thoughts on that? If you want, I'd have uh, Rita uh, Davis, if, if you'd like to give them an update on our status of the least statute litigation. Thank you for that. Thank you, Governor. Rita Davis, Counsel for the Governor. As I understand, the question is about an update on the Robert E. Lee Monument litigation. Um, so as, as many of you may know, the Richmond Circuit Court entered a temporary injunction prohibiting the removal of the Robert E. Lee uh, Monument until June 18th. We expected that action. Um, we prepared for that action. And we look forward to litigating that action successfully um, as the days may come, and any others. Let's be clear about one major thing here. Though this monument was cast in the image of General Robert E. Lee, the purpose of this monument was to recast Virginia's history, to recast it to fit a narrative that minimized a devastating evil perpetrated on African Americans during the darkest part of our past. The governor's decision today to continue forward with trying to remove this monument takes us a step closer to reclaiming the truth of Virginia's history and to reclaim it for all Virginians. And we look forward to defending that in court. No, we were not notified of the circuit court's intention to hold this hearing. Um, under law, there is not a requirement that the responding party receive a notice of a temporary restraining order hearing. I will say that in the majority of the litigation filed against the governor across the Commonwealth during this pandemic, we have been afforded that opportunity, um, but we were not this time. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Jill Atkinson with the Progress Index. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm right here. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I apologize. I apologize. I had some technical issues on my end. Uh, this question is for Governor Northam or Dr. Lane. Are there any anticipated time frames for the phases of the reopening of the schools like there were during the general reopening of Virginia? I mean, are you thinking like there'll be maybe two to three weeks in, 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 or so many weeks in length, or will the phases be based in the based in the, on individual school systems, and then also, what about the state's poorer school systems who don't have the revenues that larger systems have? What kind of assistance can be provided to them to help them get through these phases? 
the question is about the, the phases of uh, reopening our schools, and the, the phases will be consistent uh, with, uh, with the phases that we've been talking about all along. We're, uh, except for Northern Virginia and Richmond right now, who will enter phase two on Friday, uh, we're in phase two. Uh, we will, again, we will look at the, the data, um, the, uh, the number of new cases, the percent positivity, the hospital beds, uh, our PPE, testing capability, all of those things as we uh, move into phase three. But uh, a minimum of two weeks between phase two and phase three. Uh, but uh, looking at, at the data, uh, again, we want to move forward safely and responsibly. So we'll, as soon as we can, we'll, we'll let you know when we uh, are going into phase three. The second part of the question was about uh, resources. And um, we have received uh, relief uh, from the federal government through the CARES Act. Uh, we are looking uh, presently uh, of how we can distribute that uh, into our localities and uh, certainly if there, if there are school districts that uh, uh, need that help, uh, we would be glad to have that discussion with them and, and take that into consideration. Governor, I just had a question for uh, Dr. Lane who mentioned the achievement gap. Just wondering if he had some new plan uh, to close that gap. A lot of Virginia school systems have been battling the achievement gap for yes. a number of years. And then on sidebar, uh, as you have mentioned, you're going to call the legislators back. Just wondering what, what are your priorities upon calling them back, and when will you make that call? Please. Andre, I have to see three parts to your question. Um, and I'm going to mention, just touch on, on two of them. Uh, as the, the last part of your question was when are we going to call the legislature back to Richmond and, and what will our priorities uh, be during that time. Um, the, the date has not been set, um, but we look at uh, doing a reforecast uh, probably in the next few weeks into July. Um, and just uh, this is a uh, ballpark, but uh, I anticipate calling the legislature back uh, in early August uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the, the most important reason uh, is our, our budget. Uh, and as you know, we had to hit the, the pause button um, uh, uh, coming out of session this year because of COVID-19. Um, I think that we'll have a much better idea uh, in the next, in the upcoming weeks of, of what our uh, revenue is gonna be coming into Virginia. So, so that will be uh, certainly a top priority, but, but also uh, Andre with, with what's going on uh, with uh, the protest uh, and the police brutality that we've all been experiencing. Uh, there is ongoing discussion uh, with legislators uh, as to you know, how we can turn our, our listening and learning into policy, how we can turn it into action. And so, so we're having those discussions. And, and I suspect that some of those uh, uh, issues, some of those pieces of legislation will be taken up in the special session um, if that's what the General Assembly agrees to. Uh, and then also they will be continued uh, in our upcoming session in January. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just touch on before Dr. Lane comes up, and, and you know, we've talked about the Robert E. Lee statue uh, that is a, a monument of divisiveness that needs to come down. There are, there are other uh, monuments of inequities uh, that we desperately need to address as we move forward, and, and one of those is access to education. Um, and one of the things that, as you know, uh, we uh, just shot another video yesterday for it, but uh, is my wife's and my commitment and our administration's commitment to early childhood education. That is really the, the tide that lifts all boats. And uh, while we've had to hit the pause button uh, on our budget, um, it is one of my top priorities as we move forward to make sure that all of our children, uh, because we know that the, the majority of the development of the brain takes place in the first couple of years, and so we want all children, not just those that have the means, but all children, to have access to early childhood education. And I really think uh, of all the things that we can do to, to help everybody uh, start out uh, with equality in life, it, it's access to, to education. So we'll continue to make that a top priority. And Dr. Lane, I'll let you handle the rest of the question. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for the question. The um, first, I'll agree with the Governor that 
there is an achievement gap on the first day of kindergarten. And if we're going to ever eliminate the achievement gap permanently, we're going to have to do more work in the space of early childhood, more access, higher quality programs, and we've been working on that for some time. Um, in 2017, the Board of Education adopted a new accreditation system. And as part of that accreditation system, for the first time, they held schools accountable for eliminating achievement gaps as part of the system. We've been reporting achievement gaps for nearly 20 years, but we're only within the last two years at the point where we're actually holding our schools accountable. And as part of their school improvement plans, when they enter into state technical assistance, working with them on that. Not that that hasn't always been a part of the work, but now it's a requirement of the work. The board has announced that they are going to open the standards of accreditation again this year and begin to look at more ways that we can build equity into our system. We have a, we have a lot to do in the funding equity space. Uh, the, the board made recommendations and, uh, and promulgated new standards of quality, which you know was a, uh, a, a long-term look into where we want to go to make sure we're getting money to the, the schools that need them the most to make a difference for students. But ultimately, on top of those structures, we're going to have to do a better job of putting culturally responsive teaching practices into trainings for our teachers, into the standards and the way that we approach them, and building cultural competence for educators to make sure that every child sees themselves in every classroom. We have phenomenal educators in Virginia that are doing this work already, and we'll continue to build upon that. Thank you. Before we take the next question, I misspoke about uh, receiving your or requesting your absentee ballot. So the deadline is not today at 5 o'clock, it's next Tuesday at 5 o'clock. So just wanted to make that clear to everybody. Next question. Uh, Jessica Jewell with WSLS. Good afternoon. Governor, some parents are very concerned about how they're going to be able to teach their kids from home and work again in the fall. Teachers are worried about how they're going to be expected to be in the classroom five days a week with their own kids at home. Are you worried about large numbers of teachers leaving their jobs so they can stay at home with their kids? And how can you address this? And then my second question is, how will these guidelines impact students on buses? Do you want to address the bus issue? You actually address both questions if you want. Thanks again, Governor. Uh, I, I'll answer the question about buses and then, and then go back to the information on working parents. And then certainly, Dr. Forlano can help on this as well. Uh, the guidance from the Virginia Department of Health does have uh, six foot social distancing required on buses and classrooms. Um, now, that isn't to say that a school division couldn't put in place other mitigation strategies, uh, but, the, but the guidance from uh, the Virginia Department of Health is based on six-foot social distancing because the research that we've looked at has supported that as uh, the primary factor in, in uh, reducing transmission. As it relates to working families, especially our teachers, we certainly consider this uh, an, an important piece of the planning that all of our school divisions have to do. Uh, in earlier thoughts on this as we were working within our task forces, we thought about creating capacities and the such that would drive the thinking, but ultimately, the, in partnership with the Department of Health, we based the plan on, on six-foot social distancing to provide the most flexibility that we could to our local school divisions while giving them an opportunity uh, to plan for unique scenarios. So there may be school divisions that uh, create plans where they can serve uh, the, te the, the children of teachers on a daily basis. It's certainly going to take partnerships. I met today with a, a ton of uh, members of the nonprofit uh, community and the child care community that can think about filling this gap. Child care is open. And so school divisions are going to have to think about unique ways to use space. But it, it might take, uh, uh, when you think about equity, uh, it, it might take a strategy that requires students that have no access to child care and no way to afford it additional opportunities in the school as long as the schools can maintain the six-foot social distancing while creating a hybrid program for for most of the students in the school. Um, so we've, we began about a week ago having conversations with our superintendents about how they would do this. Many of our superintendents are reaching out to community partners, like I said, child care, the Y, nonprofits to help support this. But at the end of the day, what we want to make sure is as we move our students into schools, we're doing it in a safe manner, but in a partnership that allows us to make sure that working families have options for child care. So thank you, Governor. 
wondering if you could provide additional details on how CARES Act funding might be distributed to schools given that it can't replace lost revenues. And also this year was obviously, you know, historic, excuse me, in Virginia, um, you know, raising funding for schools back to pre-recession levels. So has there any been any thought to whether the state will be able to maintain that funding increase as agreed upon in the session? Yeah, uh, sec uh, Dr. Lane's going to come back up, but it's the first part of your question about the CARES Act. And again, that's that's discussion that we're having uh, as we move forward, and and uh, we, we'll consider uh, all of those requests as we move forward. If you wanted to answer the other part, thanks. Thank you, Governor. I, I'm not sure I can answer the second question on the General Assembly funding, but I will answer the, the, the question on the, on the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act was distributed. There was $238 million that came to Virginia. 90% um, of those funds went directly to localities, uh, and the federal government mandated that we use the Title I formula. It is not Title I funding, so it has, doesn't have to be spent like Title I funding. It can be spent on their needs as it relates to relief uh, from the coronavirus. But we use the Title I formula to send those funds directly to localities. The other 10 percent of funds are in what we call a state set-aside for state activities, and there will be a press release on that in the near future. Yeah, hi. Um, I just had a question about contact tracing. I was just wondering if um, the recent protests have affected that work and if questions um, they're asking people who tested positive for COVID have changed. The question is about contact tracing and the uh, recent protests. And I, I think just to, uh, I think, sum that up. We, we obviously are concerned uh, when we see individuals uh, that are protesting and that are not uh, maintaining their social distancing, not wearing uh, facial protection. We, we obviously uh, appreciate everybody's right to protest, but we want it to be done safely. And uh, so we want everybody out there in Virginia to know uh, that uh, testing is available. Uh, we encourage uh, protesters, if they feel that they've been in contact with other individuals, uh, to to go to our website to find out where the testing uh, uh, sites are uh, in their communities and, and really to, to move forward with that test. And I, um, as you know, I, on Friday, um, I was at one of the community testing centers uh, in Chesapeake. Um, it's a uh, easy test to have done. And I, I would just encourage all of you that, that have questions about whether you uh, have been in contact, whether you have the virus, uh, if you're worried about it, if you have symptoms, et cetera, to really get out there and take advantage of these community testing sites and, and uh, obtain the testing yourself. Governor, we know you've been, um, going back to the statute, preparing the legality of that kind of a move for a year or more. But this particular injunction that was filed this week, um, did that uh, catch you off guard? You, were you at all concerned that the judge would rule without the state being present? And do you know of any other suits that have been filed like this? Do you want to answer that? Thank, thank you, Greg. I want to let a lawyer answer your question. But do you have a personal response to it, though? Well, my, my response is that we've been preparing for this for a year. Um, this is a, a statue that is divisive. Um, it needs to come down. Uh, and we are on very legal, solid grounds to, to have it taken down. But I, I will let our, our counsel uh, uh, address it in more detail, if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. So as the governor said, we have the council's office that's been preparing for this um, opportunity for over a year. We were well aware of the potential legal challenges. We are so also well aware of the governor's authority to do this. The process that's begun in Richmond Circuit Court is going to be a multi-stage process. The first step was a temporary uh, restrict, uh, retaining order or straining order entered yesterday. That is by no means the end of this issue. It is only the beginning. There will be several other stages of this process by which we will vigorously defend the governor's authority to do this. And at the end of the day, we fully expect that the circuit court and maybe even necessarily the Virginia Supreme Court will affirm that. Is, is, did I get all of your questions? 
Well, not that we are aware of, but as we have seen with the Richmond Circuit Court, unfortunately, um, we may not be aware of other injunctions that have been entered in other circuit courts. But as I stand here today, we are not aware of any other actions against the governor's decision to take down the monument. Thank you. Roger Watson with the Farm Bill Herald. Thank you, Governor. Is it your belief that Confederate markers and statues in other towns across the state should also be removed for the same argument that you made when announcing the removal of the Lee statue in Richmond? I believe if I heard his question, is it, is it my belief that the other statues should be removed uh, in, in different localities? And Roger, I, I, if I heard your question correctly, um, I am in charge as governor uh, with uh, our administration and council of the uh, Lee statue, uh, which is owned by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, if there are other statues, uh, street names, military bases, um, we uh, introduced and passed legislation uh, this year. Um, uh, it was passed and it gives lo localities the, uh, the option of, of dealing with their uh, monuments, Confederate monuments, uh, names of roads, etc. So. Um, it is my position uh, that I will deal with what I have responsibility for, but I'm going to allow, uh, and that's what the General Assembly agreed on, to allow the localities to, to make decisions about uh, those that are in their regions. Governor, uh, last week the mayor of Richmond asked you for a curfew. You granted the curfew, and then yesterday the Richmond Commonwealth attorney came out and said she's going to waive incarceration for anyone who violated the curfew. We've heard from a lot of folks who say, well, what's the point of a curfew then if there's no consequences? Since you granted it, what do you, what's your take on that? Well, I, you know, I was asked by the mayor to uh, apply a curfew, which we uh, agreed to. As far as the Commonwealth's attorney's position, that's, that's something that they're going to need to speak to. I don't have authority over that. Thank you, Thank you all so much. And uh, again, I appreciate uh, you all being with us today. I think there's some exciting things going on in Virginia with reopening of our schools, getting our kids back on the, the athletic fields. And, and we, again, we can only do this because uh, we've been vigilant. Uh, we have followed the guidelines. And I, I ask you all to continue to do that so that we can continue to, to move through these phases and eventually get out of the phases, get this health crisis behind us, and, and move on and get back to as near normal lives as we can. So uh, I ask that of all Virginians, and I appreciate your cooperation. And we look forward to being with you on Thursday. Thank you.